piece is um, being inspired by uh, the apartheid in South Africa. So we don't have specific parts, but we are telling the story of um, that time in South Africa's history. My role in the piece is, um, you know, just to help tell the story. We have a section where, you know, it's relating to a, a happening where they were gunning down young people. And there's this disruption that comes in, so we're showing that in our bodies and this anger. Um, it's not so much uh, that we have a warring faction between each other, it's more um, protest with police. Hello, my name is Dane Hurst and I am the Artistic Director of Phoenix Dance Theatre. I was um, born in South Africa, 1984, and uh, introduced to dance um, through my grandmother who made costumes at a dance studio, uh, the Toynbee Club, that's what we called it, uh, was the, the Toynbee School of Ballet. And this was in Galvandale in the northern areas of Port Elizabeth and this was um, one of the segregated areas so it was quite a special situation that we had our ballet teacher as a white a white woman coming into our colored segregated area in a very dangerous part of town um, and we had this beautiful um, ballet music fused with flamenco because we also had spanish dance classes directly alongside so it was a beautiful place a beautiful place to be introduced to dance um, at a time when the country was going through so much, so much turmoil, um, the studio was a, a sanctuary for us. Um, but yes, I, I watched dancing feet underneath um, the table where my grandmother made costumes. So she was sewing and I was washing the feet, the stamping of the, the flamenco heels and then the, the classical ballet um, piano uh, next door and what was uh, interesting to me was um, there was one guy, um, Warren Adams, he was one of the very few male dancers amongst so many women. Uh, he lived down the street um, from where I was living with my, with my grandparents and he was really quite something. Um, I remember a situation where he was jumping so high that he, he landed on the floor and fell through the floor because the place was, it's a, a ramshackle studio built out of really thin wood. It was an old council building and the termites would, were eating the floor and eating through the wall. So you could see through the wall 
the different dance class was happening next door. So yeah, so he had this jump and he fell through the floors. It was, it was quite a special place. Um, but what happened was he later on had uh, received a scholarship that was set up by Nelson Mandela and Lady Anya Sainsbury. And this was a special friendship um, that sparked the creation of a, a 10 year um, uh, scholarship program and Warren Adams was one of the dancers that came over. So I was this young kid in this dance studio and I heard about Warren going overseas. And that was the first time that the world was opened to me because Port Elizabeth is a small town. Um, if you, in one suburb, you grow up in that suburb, you very rarely leave the place. We never went to the theater, we never went to do the nice things that you, we couldn't afford it. Um, I, we couldn't even afford the dance classes. My teacher just said, you know, if you can't pay, don't worry about it. Pay when you can. Um, so to have somebody from our area come overseas to London to the Rumbear School of Ballet and Contemporary and then later getting a job at Phoenix Dance Theatre. Uh, I remember seeing a newspaper clipping and reading about the company for the first time and seeing Warren, seeing where he grew up, seeing where I grew up and very early on it was like ballet. <laughs> Ballet can take you somewhere. So that's a little bit about my story. Um, I stuck to it. Uh, continued and won some dance competitions, won a bit of money. Um, I remember a really difficult situation. Uh, my dad wasn't working at the time. And I won some money in a competition in Johannesburg. I came back, I told my dad, it's like, oh, I won 20,000 rand. And he was like, oh, that's amazing. Where's the money? And I was like, ah. Oh, um, my ballet teacher is keeping it for me for when I need it, um, for when I need to come, um, maybe when I need to come overseas. So she's got it and, and this was just very difficult because he wasn't working, my mom wasn't working. We were receiving handouts from different people moving about the place, um, could have been paid for ballet shoes, you know. And there, there's this, this money and I was thinking, oh, should I just ask her for the money and for us to just use it? But anyway, she was tough, she kept it, she said no my boy, you're gonna need this to go to London. So anyways, um, I applied, sent off the, um, the DVD. I don't think it was a VHS. No, it was a DVD, yeah, uh, sent the DVD. And um, uh, Warren was in touch with Anya, and I think the scholarship had ended, but they made a special allowance for me. Um, and I went over initially um, for a six month period because the competition money paid for accommodation for that period of time. And in that time, my dad passed away. Um, I went back to South Africa and there was some money left in a, in a will. And um, I asked my mom, I said, can you just send me back to London? I know my time is done there, but I just wanna try and get a job. So took the money, came back to London and knocked on the door of Ross McKim's office at the Rumbear School and said, I'm not meant to be here, I know, but can I take class and try and um, get a job in the time that my visa allows? So they made some phone calls and um, somebody called um, the Ernest Oppenheimer Memorial Trust in South Africa and they decided to pay for one more year of tuition. And um, Anya Sainsbury then um, supported me through that year, after which I got a job. Um, Mark Baldwin came to the school he saw me um, and he gave me my first job and I joined Rumbear Company in 2004 after having come to the UK in 2003. Um, and I joined as an apprentice for two years uh, and I was lucky there because Sally Gilmore, who was a prima ballerina with Ballet Rumbear, she had passed away that year and the family had decided to set up a, tr a trust fund in her name to support young dancers and I was the first dancer to get that um, support and that paid for my two years with Rumbear Dance Company. And then my career started. So that was a little bit of my journey into dance coming from South Africa here to the UK. And I've had a really great um, time being a contemporary dancer. 
Um, I always wanted to be a ballet dancer. I remember growing up and watching a VHS tapes. My teacher made uh, a compilation of black and white videos of Baryshnikov, of Nureyev, of Vasiliev, and Eric Makamedov, and I was just watching the, and I wanted to be a ballet dancer, but of course, of my height, I'm not so tall. I was never going to be, um, you know, premier dancer. I, was, I would have to settle for character artist, but my first job was rumbe, and rumbe had ballet roots, so the training was in ballet and contemporary, so I was, I was happy. Um, and then I later auditioned for Phoenix, because Phoenix was always in the back of my head, because when I was a kid, that's where Warren Adams went. And I auditioned for the company, and at that time, Javier de Frutos was the director, and uh, he gave me a job. I um, moved up to Leeds, and um, had a good short time with the company, and then um, went back to Rumbear and finished my time with Rumbear in at the end of 2015. Um, but through that time, from 20, 2004 to 2015, beginning of 2016, I had worked with Rumbear, with Phoenix, National Dance Company of Wales, um, and I then went on to become a freelance artist working with Mark Bruce Company, working with York Dance Project, Shobana Jay Singh Company, Didi Development, Human Move, um, Mad Dogs Dance Theatre Company, Wayne McGregor, um, doing ind independent projects, falling into film, working with Clara Van Gool, doing a feature film, The Beast in the Jungle, working with Akala, doing something for Royal Shakespeare Company. So I, I moved into so many different things after having left and becoming an independent. And it was during this time that I learned a lot about how smaller independent artists work, how big companies work, how the funding system works, how audiences engage with dance, with film, with theater. Um, and it was just interesting during that period of 2016 through to 2020 as an independent artist, I learned so much more about the industry, but not always having work to go to opened up areas that you fall into things that you would never have found yourself doing by being a member of a company. So I experienced both worlds. And during this time, I, I developed the appetite for wanting to do my own thing. Um, so I, I started the, the Danehurst company, very small project, did some work with the Dalich Picture Gallery, uh, made some short films, um, and then after a while I started to feel, okay, I've been doing all of these things and I've been away from South Africa for such a long time. What have I done for those people? Where I've come from, what, what have I done to inspire some young kids there? Nothing. Um, so. I thought, okay, let me consider what I can do to use my experience, to use what, what I've learned to go back home, bring some artists with me, teach some young kids, connect with South African artists, and create um, a cross-cultural exchange that is focused on bringing and inspiring young kids. Because I was inspired by somebody from my area who came ab abroad, and I wanted to continue that cycle. So then I started this moving assembly project with the idea of taking UK artists to South Africa, co collaborating to make work, to inspire young people and to perform together. And this was supported initially by Anya Sainsbury and the Lindbury Trust. And then we got some Arts Council funding. And this, this project for me was a, a real circle of how I was given an opportunity by the scholarship and how I was able to use that to do something to better my life and then give something back to some young people. Um, and I hope that what we started with the Moving Assembly Project was able to get young people in difficult areas to get inspired by something, to develop a dream and, and to show them that something simple as dance can really like transform your life. So that's my story in a nutshell, and then the pandemic. Yeah. When I reflect on what has happened um, over the past year and a half, um, I was working with Mark Bruce Company, and we were on tour, Winchester Theatre Royal. Boris Johnson makes his announcement. 
lockdown, pandemic, everything stops, the world stops, and for everyone that was monumental. Um, and I was at home with my partner, um, Romani Pydak, she's at the Royal Ballet, so both of us, dance artists, me freelance, her being with, the, with one of the biggest companies in the world, and everything is just silence. Um, this was the beginning of a thought process of seeing how fragile the whole, your whole career is, how short it is, and both of us being at the tail end of our careers, me approaching 37, her approaching 36, uh, we were thinking, well, how long is this going to go on for? And it's, it's been going on still. It's almost, almost two years now, a year and a half, approaching two years of, it, of this. Um, but that opened up the thought of considering something different, moving into a different way of life. Um, I remember applying to Dancers Career Development for a grant to retrain as a masseur, sports massage. Um, so I did that. Um, I'm qualified now. Um, I, I, did, I, I had two, uh, level three, level five. Um, but during that time, uh, of the pandemic, I was offered an opportunity to be associate artist at the Jazz Art Dance Theatre in South Africa via Zoom. They, their director, Safisa Kweyama, had left. They'd written to me asking if I could um, take over his position or to do some interim work. So from June 2020 to December, 2020, I worked with them as associate artist. I choreographed a 35-minute work. I curated a program. I taught them daily, um, all via Zoom. And Zoom, it was a lifesaver for all of us because after being home for months and months and not knowing what to do, we discover, oh, we can utilize this um, online technology to, con to connect. And I worked with 15 dancers for six months we did photo shoots, we did productions, we did f short films, me being in London and then being in Cape Town. And what I realized was that I enjoyed the process of, of overseeing a program. And, and this uh, opened up my thinking. Um, and during this time, the, um, Sharon Watson had stepped down um, from Phoenix um, and sh as she took on uh, the directorship um, of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance in Leeds, and the offer was there for application. Uh, and at the same time, there was an application for National Dance Company of Wales, and at the same time, there was an application for artistic director for Jazz Art Dance Theatre. Um, and I thought, okay, Jazz Art Dance Theatre, Cape Town, Phoenix Dance Theatre, Leeds, South Africa, UK, I'm torn in the middle. So I applied for both. And Phoenix got back to me and said, after the interview process, which was really, really strict, really thorough, the whole process was absolutely incredible. Um, and with, with Jazz Art, I had just sent my proposal and they accepted. And I was torn, like, what do I do? Do I go back to South Africa? Or do I take up this post of Phoenix Dance Theatre's historic company, approaching 40 years, founded in 1981 by three black men from the area. Um, and I thought, wow, one has so much responsibility in the weight of history, and another in South Africa, also um, a historic company. I think they're about, um, they're approaching 50. Um, so two huge organizations, one focusing on youth development, because what Jazz Art do is they find young people and they train them for three years and then they form a company after that. So that's very much my heart. And then Phoenix, which was in my heart and my, my mind all along from when I was a kid. So um, in the end, um, I, I, I couldn't walk away from the opportunity to be a part of Phoenix Dance Theatre, to be a part of that history, um, to be a part of that, that legacy. Because if you look at how the company was started, it was started by young men in their teens, 
David Hamilton, I think he was 18 when he founded the company. Um, so an incredible situation for, for three black men to, found, to found a company and for that company to still be standing today. The company today stands um, and shares a building with a Northern Ballet Theatre, um, fantastic building. And yes, this year we are uh, in November, approaching 40, 40 years, and I've, I've curated the program, selecting works that have been celebrated throughout um, the past few decades and um, putting together a gala program and looking forward to inviting different companies from around the UK to share with us and celebrate with us this milestone because it's not easy for a company to exist it requires a lot of commitment a lot of people to to run it a lot of support financial support but also the work needs to be good it needs to connect with people people need to feel that what this company is doing is inspiring them is 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 causing them to dream to see the world in in in, in a way that is inspiring and the, the company is still standing today because all the artistic directors, all of the dancers, the technicians, the admin staff, the fund, fundraiser, the, the arts council, everybody that supported the company has managed to bring it where it is today because they believe in the power of dance, the power of art to change lives. So um, here we are now, we're still in the pandemic, we're post-pandemic. I stepped in in February of 2021 and um, it was... Uh, really surreal situation because I came to Leeds at the beginning of the third lockdown. I took a flat without seeing it. I saw a video of it online. I moved in. Everything was shut. The dancers were working from home on Zoom and um, some, some dancer that just had decided to leave. So it was a really strange situation and started to get some new dancers in. I had to um, connect myself with, uh, with the community, try to connect with the community in, in this way when everyone was still um, locked inside. So it was really tricky initially. And on top of that, um, I didn't even realize that I was going through a process of grieving for having not been doing what my passion has been for the past year, which is dancing. And taking this job also meant that my dance would have to stop. So taking the job, learning about the organization, learning about their history, trying to formulate relationships really quickly, trying to embed myself in, trying to understand what the company was needing there and then post pandemic, no performances to inspire the dancers to, in, to get um, um, the, the audiences and the community engaged. So we had to work on making short films, to sending the films out there, but not knowing when we'd actually be able to perform. So. Uh, put the program together and just go through a stage of, of rehearsals and rehearsals and planning for the future. So where we are now, we put in together a plan for the next year. And then before that plan is even out, we have to put a plan together for the next five years. Um, and it's exciting, it's daunting, um, but also it's where we are now. Um, I, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, I'm excited, I'm inspired, and I'm also <laughs> filled with anxiety for the enormity of the task to carry the company, not by myself, of course, because the company is made up of a team of incredible individuals. Um, but we have a task to carry this company through the pandemic, to put on the first show on the 16th of October, which will be West Side Story Symphonic Dances in collaboration with Opera North. Um, my first choreographic work for the company. Um, we are here now in the Opera North studios working with the set designed by Charlie Edwards and you can see the graffiti up against the wall um, by Hiro, um, the graffiti artist. Um, it's an exciting team. We've got costumes by Ana Inez Jabares Pita. I worked with her um, uh, when I made a short work with the uh, Dalich Picture Gallery. She won the Lindbergh Prize for design and um, she's creating the costumes. 
And uh, yes, we've got spoken word by Khadija Ibrahim, uh, Leeds based, she's author, spoken word artist, um, doing incredible work in the community. So we've got a, a fantastic team of creatives working towards putting this show on. Um, what, is, what is interesting about this production is that it's meant to be an abstract response to the symphonic dancer's music taken from the West Side Story um, uh, musical. Um, and Leonard Bernstein's music is so full of movement, is so full of life and, and drama and intensity and joy and chaos. Um, and when you hear it, you think West Side Story. You know, you see the film, you see those characters, you see the sharks, the jets, the conflict, the love story. And then you think about Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet and all of that. And what for me was the biggest task was when I had my meeting with Upper North, they said to me, here's the music. It has to be abstract. You can't use anything from the narrative. You have to do an interpretation of the music in an abstract way. So from the beginning, I was thinking, OK, people will hear the music. They're going to be thinking about West Side Story. I need to create another world for them. I need to introduce them to a different space. So I reached out to Khadija Ibrahim. We started working in some poetry. I uh, started looking at nature and our human interaction and conflict with nature and to create a landscape that is completely different to the landscape that we think this work is going to take place in. And um, I've not started on choreographing the, po the poetry section yet, but that's going to be a separate prologue that will introduce us and open our minds to a different world before we get hit with the Bernstein uh, music. Um, so I've got a task on my hands. We are two and a half weeks into our process. Um, we are in this building here until the end of next week. Um, it's going okay so far. Um, I would love to finish the um, all nine movements by tomorrow, uh, so we can do a run through roughly to see what we have. Uh, but I'm, ex I'm excited about this work. I'm stressed about this work. Um, and I, I really hope that the audiences will love it. But what is different about the take that we are take that we are, the approach that we are taking is that I was looking at the, the music and 50s and 60s America and also looking at the work that, the, um, that, is, that is twinned with uh, the symphonic dancers in the program, which is Trouble in Tahiti, which looks at a family situation in 50s, 60s America um, and, an I and, and a desire for the perfect life, the desire to build a family and to be a part of the world in, in perfect harmony. And it's, it's very romanticized ideal of what a family should be and how you should find your, your place in this world. But there's tension there, there's fracture there, there's a, there's a child that is part of seeing a marriage slowly falling apart. And symphonic dances follows this. So trying to find a connection between Trouble in Tahiti and West Side Story symphonic dances, and it not being West Side Story, but it being something else connected to desire to find a place, desire to belong, conflict, um, tragedy, um, but also um, a situation of reaching for hope and wanting the world to be better. And I look at 50s and 60s, South Africa, the, introduc the introduction of the Group Areas Act that was imposed by the government at the time, which people received, they received these eviction notices. People lived in, in um, in different, like for example, District 6, South End or Sophia Town, um, different parts of the country, Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Johannesburg, 
mixed melting pot communities, different people, black, white, Chinese, Indian, Muslim, Christian, all, all people living together. And then this Group Areas Act forced separation, people forced into different parts according to skin color, and that just being imposed, boom. This is your eviction notice, the bulldozers are coming, this is your new address, we're coming in a few weeks and that's it, pack your bags. Um, I'm using that particular time, which is 50s, 60s South Africa, and using music created in 50s, 60s America, and using that to inform this work, which is very personal to me. Um, and what I realized was that I needed to inform the dancers about this particular time. Um, we had to go into discussions about around racism, around, um, around just, just the sheer weight of what this did and where people are today and how people see each other today that conflict, that, that pain, that hurt, and everything that, that unfolded as a result of this imposition, that still today people live in segregated areas and still today people have that hurt of being torn apart. Um, so the work is, is, is uh, informed by this as a foundation. But if you look at the world we live in today, if you look at the walls that are going up in different parts of the world, if you look at the, the migrant crisis that is still going on, it's we live in a world where people are just wanting to, to find a place to live, find a place to belong. But there's always this conflict, this imposition, this obstacle that is imposed on different people in different parts of the world. Um, and if you look at where we are now, I'm working with um, a company of young dancers. They've all just come through the pandemic. They've all just come through a, a situation where Globally, we had this Black Lives Matter movement. We had deep discussions around what that meant in the company, what that means in the world, what that means for what we do as a company going forward. What are we saying? Um, the work can't just be abstract anymore. We have to be talking about real things and putting out real things to the, to, to the audiences because um, I, when I approached them initially, I was approaching it from the abstract. I was going to use the music to inform the movement and for us to find meaning in a poetic way. But it was very, very clear in the early stage of the creative process that we needed something deeper. They needed something deeper from me for, for them to make sense of what this means. Um, two groups of people clashing. Why are they clashing? What was the reason? And in South Africa, it was like, boom, this, this was imposed from the outside in division divide and conquer. So I'm using some of that to inform the work. Um, and yeah, we, we're moving in an interesting direction. Um, the work is not done. Um, I'm excited by it, but like I said, um, we have this amazing set design that is also an obstruction. Um, it's a reflection on, on us coming into the world and then we have this rigidity of structure of society, how things are supposed to be, how you should behave, what you should do, how, sh how you should conduct, what you should say, what you can't say. It's like, boom, you have to now navigate through life and find yourself in these angles and just, just live according to how things are carved out for you. So the, the, this, the structure rotates, it carves the space, it returns to how it was, but it, it's con constantly changing our perspective. So I hope that we will show different sides of, this, of different experiences. And that's what we are using, an experience from another part of the world, South Africa. And we're taking music from another view of the world, America, at the same period of time, and then mixing that in, and then bringing in poetry to take us out of that, to give us a, a sense of space. So all of these into the pot of creativity. Let's see what's going to happen on opening night. Thank you.